Well, good morning, Jan Recker. Hey, Nick. Uh, today's an exciting day. A couple of years of our collaboration for uh, and, and, and our special issue on managing artificial intelligence at MIS Quarterly is finally out. You and I collaborated with, with Bingu and, and Radhika Santhanam, and, and man, it's done. It's out there. It's done. It was quite a bit of work, wasn't it? I mean, I look at this, uh, number one, I'm still very happy when a paper comes out, you know, in print or in digital, whatever it means, but, you know, when it's finished and uh, you reflect and thinking. And, and I tell you what, like running a special issue is the same amount of work, if not more than, than doing a paper yourself, isn't it? I think it's more. I think I could have written a couple papers in the effort that it took to do this. But, but I'll tell you what, I'm very proud of it. And here's why. There are a couple of reasons why. The first is the issue of our time is artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. It is the issue. After we, you know, had the big data explosion, we started realizing we can analyze this stuff automatically. So current waves of machine learning and, and are, are, are the, and we wrote the intro piece and uh, kind of sorted a special issue that is really the first one in our field and the first one in any management field on the management of the most important issue of our time, which it's like, come on, isn't that a privilege that we were able to do this? I'm so excited. Yeah, it's like absolutely. I mean, I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think the focus of managing AI is brilliant. I would like to claim that was my idea, but it wasn't. But that's not the point. But, you know, it's great. It's not the first special issue on AI. So we're not the first on this, but we're the first on the issue. AI is not an, an issue. AI is just, no. you know, well, we're going to talk a little bit later about what it actually is but you know managing it managing that form or wave of technology that's really the issue isn't it and you know tell you what like i think for the first time in a long time it could be that the is field with the special issues actually you know ahead of the curve you know you mentioned big yeah. data and and there were a few other ones like the e-commerce booms and so forth and to be honest i think we we're always a bit behind when we? we were laggards not leaders yeah. uh, but here we're not the first on ai but i think these papers and maybe even our article is, is is first in terms of summing up what we know and what we need to do about how to manage ai which is really the thing yeah so so that's what we're going to do in today's podcast first off we're going to talk about our managing ai special issue and i think to do so we want to characterize the way you and i think about managing ai so that that and and ben and radica and, and what we put in that intro and then i want to talk a little bit about the papers and and what we're going to have is the next few podcast episodes so this will be short today but we're going to release every other day right uh, yeah. uh interviews with the authors for each one of the papers. So. That's right. We, we have uh, seven uh, papers that have now come out in the special issue. And what we did after they got accepted, which was a couple of months ago, basically between April and, and June, we uh, reached out to all the author teams and invited them on the podcast and all of them accepted. And we talked with all of them and produced episodes about every single paper about managing AI. And we yeah. will release that every two days. So, you know, basically everyone, you'll get a blast of podcast episodes over the next two weeks or so. Yeah. And it's mostly going to be about the process rather than, you know, we figure people can read the papers. Plus we're having a showcase. Uh, MIS Quarterly is having a showcase online, a webcast that uh, towards the end of September, where we will showcase the substance of all the papers, but this is less about the substance, more about the process. And, and before we get into the substance, uh, Wrecker, let's talk about the process real quick. You said that, you know, the uh, MIS quarterly in our field uh, is really the first in this managing AI, you know, to set the, hopefully we're setting the agenda a little bit. That was our goal. So in order to do that, we had to have a really ambitious cycle. We had papers due November 9th, November 15th, 2019. That's right. Yeah. And we had accepted papers in just over a year. Some of these papers did multiple rounds. Some of them did six rounds. Some of the, I think the, the, the fastest one did maybe four rounds, yeah. but uh, right, just over a year. So that's one of the things I'm very proud of is that we show, and these are high quality papers. These, these are very good that we didn't shortchange uh uh, things because it was a, a fast special issue, right? No, we did not. I mean, it was the same process as always. We had SEs. In fact, every paper had two SEs, plus the other two were sort of uh, like advisors, plus an AE, plus something between two and three or four reviewers. So it was a very normal process. We just did it much faster by being obnoxious <laughs> and oh. pushy on everyone, including ourselves. So I guess that's fair to say, yeah. 
And you know, it's cool. Everybody rose to the occasion. I mean, even the authors that didn't uh, submit things, you know, needed a little bit of extra time or something, maybe a week or two of extra time. No one needed the six months of extra padding that we have in the review process. We just accelerated it, did a few rounds, and we have wonderful papers, right? So, so that was a cool process innovation. But I have, a, I have a different question for you, Nick. I mean, that's the one that's that's really uh, you know been driving us and our thinking, our reading for a long time. Nick, what is what exactly is artificial intelligence? What is AI? Aha. Uh-huh. So this is, of course, writing the front end piece, right? We had to come up with this. And, and the short answer is, well, what we currently call AI is the current wave of uh, machine learning tools, usually based on some uh, neural network uh, uh, approach, right? So it's machine learning. And that's what we call AI right now and all these things. The problem is, if you really look at AI in an abstracted sense, um, AI like if you look at, say, Russell and Norvig, right, who are the definitive uh, big thinkers on artificial intelligence, they say it's kind of acting like a human or, or thinking like a human. They say it's uh, kind of the frontier of, of research on artificial intelligence. And, and when you look at it that way, anything we've ever done in computing is AI, right? Yeah. The, the simplest algorithm is essentially doing something a human, some logical process that a human used to do. So the very first, the very simplest uh, algorithm, and and, and Turing's test, right, was solved in the 70s. So what we found when we really started pushing on what is AI, we realized that, yeah, the the back of the envelope definition is currently it's, you know, neural nets and and it's machine learning, right? But really, if you look at it in a historical context, uh, there is no thing that is AI. Whatever the frontier is in computing is AI. And the moment it gets... uh, Used in practice, it's yeah. no longer called AI. Then it's just exactly. called the thing that it is, right? Like like an expert system. In the 1980s, expert systems were artificial intelligence at the time. Now they're just, you know, rule-based programs, right? That's, that, that's absolutely real. I think that was my big aha moment as well when we started digging into the history and went back till the early 50s where some of these ideas originated from. And you look at a, a lot of the AI systems or even the AI literature on these AI systems that, you know, they also go back to the 80s. And you look at them like, that's not AI. How can that possibly be AI? That's the simplest rule-based system. Or that's the simple regression tree that I've ever seen. You know, decision trees, regression analysis, uh, rule-based logic. You look at them and think, like, that's nothing. Well, it's nothing now. It used to be the absolute frontier, the newest advance in computational algorithms and, you know, in decision-making, really. That's what it's about. Yeah how computers could be used to make decisions, not to augment and not to support, but to really to make decisions. And, yeah. you know, and that changes. And it, 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 it actually literally changed while we were doing the special issues. I mean, the yeah. last one or two years have seen a, a big move already. I mean, machine learning, that's no longer the frontier. That's hardly ever AI anymore, is it? I mean, that's sort of like the AI from, the, from 2015, the AI it's of like 2020. running a regression. So yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But yeah, so so running a regression, right? So it's probabilistic uh, decision support system is how we might think of it, right? As opposed to a, uh, a another form of decision support system like rule based or whatever. Now, what is uh, so decision is one big thing. So we found out that it's this frontier, right? Wrecker, and, and that was our first uh, uh, lesson: is that AI is not a thing. It's not an identifiable, discernible thing. It's more of a frontier. And it's always this moving frontier. Yeah. Uh, and it's a moving frontier of, and, and we talk about it in our issue of, of performance and scope, right? That it's always improving, especially now with all this data and everything uh, that it can be trained on the current way of this machine learning. And then the other is, of course, the, the scope. It's being applied to new and different things, right? Some of the classic things, and we have special issues on the classic things, like hiring in organizations, yeah. We have one paper there, uh, like uh, medical decisions, right? We, we have a, a, a paper there as well. And, uh, you know, these are domains, but now it's getting more and more. It's, it's being applied to more and more domains, right? And I, and I like it because these different dimensions of that frontier, whether it's moving towards, uh, you know, expanding the scope or uh, increasing the performance, they, they all invoke very different challenges. You know, so the frontier of performance, what we call the frontier of performance or getting even better at making uh, AI computations, you know, that gets very technical. Then you talk about all sorts of different types of networks and, and so forth. You talk about issues like the frame problem and so forth. So this is really interesting when you think about the frontier of scope. So the 
the number of domains and the, the set of applications where it's being addressed, you know, that sometimes that involves social issues more so than technical issues. If you think, when you think about how AI moved into medical decision-making or um, sort of hiring um, decision-making where you have a lot of thorny um, privacy issues, ethical issues, or really, you know, life and death types of situations, that's a very different story than, you know, having a, an algorithm that morphs your face into mine or our face into a cat or, you know, whatever else is done. That's a performance issue, not really a, a scope issue, right? So right. really interesting to consider where that uh, frontier is moving, how it's moving. And I think over time, you know, it moves in, in different ways. Like I always think of it as these oscillations that somehow it sort of ticks more towards performance. For a while, that's a big thing, moving the frontier of performance. Then scope, then both at the same time. And then sort of drilling back into and, and thinking more about topics like how do we actually learn or, you know, what's with the autonomy or how inscrutable does an algorithm have to be or how can we solve that problem? I mean, these are the problems of the scope but sort of deep within the concept of AI itself. Yeah, so this is what we did. We wrote this kind of front end and our, we have a definition of artificial intelligence right where we call it but we call it the frontier of computational advancements right decision making to to uh, uh in some way that references humans we have this performance frontier scope frontier and like you just said there are these different facets of those frontiers and they have mm -hmm. to do with and what we have in the paper is autonomy learning and inscrutability and, and i don't think we should go into that too much i'll tell you what uh people can read that but I'll tell you what I'm most excited about from walking away from this effort. And in, in, in the next few days, right, we're going to go over each one of these papers. And the papers, I mean, we have one really cool econometric study on drug yeah. discovery. Like I just mentioned, we have a couple really cool qualitative papers, one on hiring uh, uh, technologies, another one with uh, 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 medical decision-making technologies, right, imaging. Then we have really cool experiment. We have an agent-based model on organizational learning. We have a, a conceptual piece on fairness, which as far as I know, is the first kind of fairness paper in, in IS, top yeah. IS journal. Uh, and, and from what I understand with fairness papers is they are always submitted and they're always rejected in IS. <laughs> Uh, so it's one of those things where it's like, I'm very proud that we <laughs> got one through. Uh, what did I miss? Oh, you missed the survey, like the CIO oh, that's right. the survey on that's strategic right. decision making around AI in organizations. So, right. so I it like did. this as well, like uh, as, as sort of as the years went by and we sort of uh, honed in on the set of papers that would eventually make it, I was always very proud that, you know, we have such a diversity of methods. So like, to me, it yeah. looks like AI is the phenomenon of our time, how to manage it. And it's open to all paradigms. It really is. Yeah. The survey, yeah. econometric, ethnography, uh, experiments, uh, even, uh, you know, theory development, simulation, everything's there. The only thing that was missing, unfortunately, in the end was design science, even though we did, we did get these types of papers. They just, you know, uh, you know, for the realities of that process just just didn't make it i guess yeah there were a couple actually that broke our hearts over the course of it yeah that had a lot of potential were the right topic and it's like we couldn't get it in time for the special issue now i'll give you my two takeaways from this exercise personal takeaways okay. the first is this if managing ai is the same thing and ai is just the current wave of it basically right the frontier of it well then managing ai is the same thing as managing it at some level and most of what we do, and, and we see this out in management with some of the articles we cite, is that they pretend that, you know, 50 years of the IS discipline does not exist. And they're rethinking things like saying, you know, there's a, a certain logic that these AI tools have. Well, they had this argument in the 80s in IS about the logic that IT tools have versus, yeah. you know, humans. And it's like they're totally ignoring the 50 years of research we've done on IT. And a lot of what we know about AI can inherit or can at least be based on, say, decision support systems or IT and organizations and all of that. So the fact that the rest of the world is going to ignore it, that's an opportunity for IS researchers to be like, hey, we've addressed this. We've gone past it. And here's where we are. Right. So so to attend to the cumulative tradition, I think there's an opportunity for us. Yeah, uh, and, the, and then the second thing I realized is, but it doesn't necessarily translate. Always, because as we point out with autonomy, the other things weren't autonomous in the same way. And we have this bracketing idea in the in the paper. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning the previous ones, the, these learn without being programmed. That's different, right? 
And then the inscrutability, of course, is something, uh, you know, whether it's explainability, interpretability. So, so there are differences. And that's what I think we did. And that's what we forced every author team to do. And they did. And I think it works is that you have to attend to the cumulative tradition. IS has studied this stuff. Here's how it's different. And then we, yeah. and then you mentioned the, the strategy paper, this, the, the CIO paper, they actually did that where they controlled for IT and then looked at the incremental effect of AI, which I think is cool. Which was really cool. So let me, let me comment on uh, this point that you're making with two of mine. So um, number one, this notion of, I think what, one of the fair things we can say about the, the learning we took away from, from running this special issue in the papers is that um, managing AI is unlike IT management. And you can see that not only because we say it, but also in the papers themselves. If you look closely at what they're about, one of them is about systems development. The other one's about decision-making. The third one is about IT strategy, so to speak, if you want. The next one is about innovation, You know the relationship between AI and innovation. So all of these are classic persistent IS topics. You know, decision making has been a thing we've been studying for a long time. So is systems development, so is strategy and so forth. And all of them not only build on the premise, but also demonstrate mathematically, formally, empirically, conceptually, all of them demonstrate that it's different with AI. So, yeah. you know, managing technology is not, it's not just the next generation of system. It's something different. So that's a good thing um, for us to take away. And I agree with you that it, put, it puts forward an opportunity for us as a field um, especially because what we've been trying to do is unblack box both the management and the AI, right? Both the artifact and the, and the practice. And whereas, you know, some of the papers we read in, in the management disciplines, they talk about, you know, what's different, but they don't really talk about what, what's different about AI. And in computer yeah. science, it's very often the other way around. So that makes, that, that can be a great contribution. Now, my worry is whether that's enough, you know, whether they will yeah. listen, whether they will, that's not their fault, you know, whether they will yeah. even find it, whether we will have the impact onto these other fields that you you say we, we can now have. Yeah, I agree with you. But the question is, how do we get there? You know, yeah. and, and I think we're always- uh, They're not going to read like, MISQ. They're not going to read MISQ. We have to read MISQ and write to their journals and then they'll reject us because they don't know us or something. But we, we need to do that. We need to do that. We also need to go to their journal. So I like the idea of a showcase, the, the showcase that we're running, that we get all the authors and then we can talk and discuss their papers. That's great. Does that mean AOM folks will come to us? You know? So I think we need to go to them. And we, mm -hmm. to be in all fairness, we haven't discussed this. We have not discussed that we're going to run a PDW at AOM next year. We also haven't discussed that we go to VLDB or ACM, some conference and talk about what we learned, right? We've That's historically been very bad at, at, at reaching out, but we're also always saying, well, they should listen to us more. They should cite us. We have something to contribute. Well, that's true, but I think we need to go to, to them, to their meeting. What's that one in Europe? There's a big conference in Europe management every year that they- The URAM. Is sort it of your the own? European yeah. Academy of Management sort of regional conference. I've never. It was been something there. different than Academy. I don't know. Egos. Egos. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been either. See, that's yeah. what I mean. I've never been to AOM either. I've, I've, you know, I say these things and I don't do them. So that's. I go to AOM, AOM every year. Well. You do. Yeah. I go to every, and, but I hang out with the OSIS people. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, and I've put some papers in Tim, the Technology and Innovation Management Group, and you know, I, I pay attention to what they're doing, but they don't know me. I think they're a looser community too. They don't know each other as well as like IS people. Well, it's also a much bigger community overall. So more heterogeneous, more diverse as well. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you what, the thing, one of the things that, and, and we'll get past our little intro to the special issue here, but uh, one of the things I like that we did, and this is the thing that annoys me. When I read papers that try to set the agenda, they give a list of lame research questions that you might <laughs> want to explore. And I'm not sure. I think some people think that that gives uh, junior people some ideas and then they go explore those questions, but I don't see it happening. I don't think anybody actually reads that list of questions and says, oh, there's a good question. I'll motivate my research around that. Right. So we didn't do that in this paper. I think some of the early versions we thought, hey, we're going to, and then it just didn't work. Right. So then we decided, why don't we come up with what we think are substantive areas for future research? Some real. So not all of them, just some, you know, just select yeah. that substantive. Don't areas. come up with a list. Don't try to be comprehensive. Just give examples. And we did. And I thought mm. they were really cool. The first one I think was yours. Uh, it's this idea of uh, the physical, right? AI yeah. And physicality, right? How it, uh, so we talk about materiality and digital materiality and all this stuff, but really robots, 
cars, 3D printers, these things are going to make stuff in the real world. Fab, yeah. right? And it's like, let's look at physicality, not just materiality and how AI, you know, so I thought that was cool. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like it just just last week, I mean, they they you know, they built the first 3D printed house somewhere here in Germany. And I had a conversation with someone that is about uh, uh, 3D printing mortar and construction materials, you know, big, hefty physical things. And, you, you know, I, I've been doing some research about the circular economy and it's, it's fascinating and, and how that can be digitalized. You can digitalize a lot of things, but waste is still waste, you know, and stuff needs is still temporarily, <laughs> you know, at some point, at some point in time, somewhere it needs to be moved and it's yeah. bricks, it's heavy, you know, yeah. and you can't just digitalize that away. And I find that fascinating uh, that, that you have that contrast, right? So yeah. sure, I can give you a little database that tells you where certain bricks are and how much mortar you can possibly print, but someone's got to do it. And then, you know, a house is a pretty big thing. So is an airplane and so forth. So I, I do think materiality just in general is a, is a is a big topic and, and physicality in AI. As soon as you have, I don't know, AI driven robots doing surgeries, which they already do. That's a, that's a big thing, right? So that's, yeah. I, th I think that's an obvious frontier. It's, it's not necessarily a new idea. It certainly isn't mine, but it's certainly one of the up and coming things. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other idea we had for the future was around adversarial learning, right? So that machine good, learning. Yeah. Yeah. I love it too. And it's totally changed the way I view the world, especially now I'm really getting into uh, kind of as a hobby, almost uh, paying attention to quantum computing only because I don't know if you're familiar with what's happening in quantum computing, but the, the whole quantum uh, supremacy idea is that when you reach a thousand qubits, then you'll be able to break encryption. When you can break encryption, right? Bitcoin's worthless. Uh, wow. yeah, everybody, you can just write. So your credit card, they'll take all that. So, but the, it, but we've always thought that's far off, right? Because they're still duct taping these quantum computers together, right? They they still are, are trying to. But here's what happened last year: Google, and I don't know which one did which, but Google, Honeywell, uh, and Honeywell, by the way, bought uh, Cambridge uh, Quantum. So they're they're right there, and then uh, what Borgatti, Bugatti, whatever the the, the French one is. Uh, so what they're doing is last year they they got to between twenty and eighty demonstrated qubits. So we've never been at that scale. So if you think, and then this year they're expecting it to go from one hundred to two hundred qubits. So you see all of a sudden, and I just read this article saying you know this quantum supremacy could be as early as twenty twenty three. Now, a lot of people are arguing with that, saying impossible because it's still, you know, all qubits are not equal. And just because you get there in some benchmark performance doesn't mean you'll get there in the world. So, so it gets complicated. But the fact is, in the next decade, this quantum thing is real. And if the quantum thing is real, your machine learning is going to be against the adversary. So the way you're going to code, the future of coding is going to be machine learning. You code your own adversary. You have an arms race so that you beat the opponent's adversary, right? So this adversarial computing is the paradigm of the future, I think. And I need to write that down. You, you need to write that down. Like, like two thoughts that pop into my head. Number one, you know, like special issues, I think, in, in that sort of level of journal, that's a one one time in a, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. So you, I don't think you and I will ever get to do that again. But mm. someone, <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be cool to launch a special issue around quantum computing and all the issues and, and opportunities that come with this, not in 10 years when the thousand qubits will be right now, like yeah. an entire special issue only with predictive prospective papers, with ideas, with simulations. I don't know what, you know, very yeah, different kind like of conceptual. I love that idea, but here's the issue. And we were just talking with my, we have a paper now accepted into Hicks with Corey Angst, my associate, and then one of our students who's actually a PhD student in Minnesota, Joe Jenkins, and it's on quantum computing. Uh, and it's on quantum computing business models. And now that I've been getting into it, I realize that the literature on quantum computing is about quantum computing right? How to do an algorithm, how to duct tape your quantum computer together, right? Or quantum physics and quantum mechanics, which I've read. I recently read a book on quantum physics and, and I could say half the book, I could even understand the English, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then, but I tried to, for, and it was really meant for dummies, right? So, so here. Quantum computers for dummies in one of these red, uh, no, not, not red, these sort of yellow covers. <laughs> Next to marriage, marriage for, for dummies and how to publish for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what the name of the book was. It was actually an excellent book. I don't want well, to we'll take it. We'll put it on the show me. notes, right? All right, we'll, we'll put, put it on the show notes. notes. I can't and, find and it at the moment. But uh, but here's what we and then we're thinking: How do we do a research paper around this? 
And the fact is, so, so they're the people doing the, 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 the technical details. And then there's policymakers. And I realize that's the problem. Nobody in government and their assistants understands anything about this. The big companies like IBM and Honeywell and, and whoever are just going to the government saying, look, here's a threat. Give us more money. Right. Who's setting policy? Who's you know, I think Volkswagen actually is one of the big leaders, believe it or not, in applying quantum to a number of different things, a number of drug companies and pharmaceuticals. So, so it's like, who's regulating this? Who's thinking about it? What is our... I, I listened to a podcast the other day and they made the analogy of uh, the invention of the nuclear bomb. So they basically said, well, a lot of the technological innovations that come out of science, at the same time, scientists also spoke up about the need or actually pushing the regulation. And they, they gave the nuclear bomb as a sort of like, all right, we had the team, you know, the, uh, what was it called again? The uh, Manhattan Project, right? And they, they, they developed it and they spoke and said, well, we just did this, but we know what it does. So we should, let's never use it, you know? And that sort of, that second part has gone missing, right? Yeah, but we used it. In the first, in the, in the meantime, yeah. right, and a lot of people died. They, yes, that's true. But you know, like a lot of the innovations that come forward now, they don't even have anyone of the the scientists or the engineers that, that develop it actually speak up to, in the same sense that they did back then. You know, so I think what we need to do is let's think about quantum and let's think about how we can approach it in an interesting way. That's that actually is a research question because on the one hand, it's really just a fast computer. And it's like, all right, doing all our research questions still hold. But on the other hand, it's such an extreme performance difference that it's a difference in kind. So and I'm going to do a Nick Berente here. So what I'm hearing here, Wrecker, oh, no, wait. What I'm hearing here, Berente, is uh, we're going to do a future podcast on quantum computing. But what right. we do, you need to find someone that knows a little bit more about this than I do. Because you can't talk with me about quantum computing. My knowledge of quantum computing is basically from... Uh, um, uh, from science fiction literature. I haven't seen right. one. I certainly haven't read a, a book on it, uh, but you know, let, we, let's find someone and, and talk about it. All right. All right. I, uh, I, I will. All right. The last one that for, all right, we have two other future directions. Uh, one is that I think if I were advising a young PhD student looking to do something in AI, particularly if they're interested in things like explainability, interpretability, this is where I would send them. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll give you the setup. Uh, right now, there's tons of stuff on explainability, interpretability. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a research project with some, some colleagues. Well, on you're it. doing and a research project on anything. On everything. For, yeah. for but, but no, they're doing the literature review and it's like every minute there's another 30 papers, right? Yeah. So, so this is a domain that is just incredible, but it's oversaturated. And, but here's the one thing about this domain. It's all either technical yeah. or psychological cognitive, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. about individuals interpreting an algorithm or it's about some sort of technical issue. But what we know about human interpretation is that it's deeply embedded in language and social and context. context. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. So so that's what I would do uh, if I were doing Well, I'll tell say, you what, like that was the big surprise in the uh, first round of submissions. We got about like 70 or something submissions, if I remember correctly, around that number. And I expected a lot of XAI, explainable AI submissions. You know, you remember how many we received? Very one? few. Well, uh, one, well, I think. I think there one, were a couple. Yeah, one yeah. or two. Like, I thought that was the big topic because I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of the technical works, you know, in, in disciplines very close mm -hmm. to mainstream IS, like software yeah. engineering. That's a big topic there. But yeah. I was very surprised that there wasn't a lot of, you know, very big mature research coming through in our field. And I thought, wow, yeah. that, that was really surprising to me. I thought there would be a yeah. lot more coming through. And I'll tell you what the reviewers said inevitably, and this is the interesting thing. Uh, they always said, oh, this has already been done. In the couple that I've seen, maybe in the special issue, maybe outside of the special issue, anything in explainable AI, if you're doing like a psychological experiment, apparently, I mean, there's so much out there that they're like, oh yeah, this is done. This is old news already by the time you submit it. So it's a very hard, reviewers are brutal in that way, right? The, I'll wager a lot of that, that is done on that sort of individual level, cognitive yeah, level, is. you know, you got a bunch of students together, give them something and figure out which one is more explainable on that level, probably on the sort of organizational or even industry or bigger societal level, sort of, you know, how do we no. deal with explainability of AI to, you know, to the population of Germany? No, I haven't. Seen it doesn't exist. Of that. No, absolutely it doesn't no. exist. All right. And then the final thing, and again, and you know this about me yeah. is that, all right, there's cross cutting. It's not with, uh, and, and it was ethical issues. And, yeah. and I really think ethical issues. So I have a friend who's a partner at a law firm and he said five years ago, 
they maybe maybe had a client and he's a big law firm, right? Uh, maybe had a client doing privacy and data uh, stuff. Now they do not have a client that isn't doing privacy and data stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and really, if you look at it, what we're talking about, interpretability, explainability, uh, privacy and data, if you look at like workforce uh, replacement and, and all, there are so many, really the ethical issues the big ethical issue in management for the last 23 years has been sustainability. And that still exists, of course, but now there's like a rebirth of ethical issues in management and they're all around essentially AI. Well, I think, I think a lot of the issues is that in IS um, we haven't had a lot of people historically dealing with ethics. So I remember Roger Clark uh, uh, doing some work um, around ethics, just in ethics and IT in general. There's a few others, but they're a little few in, 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 in between. So, um, but, you know, for example, one of the papers, the, the fairness papers, one of the co-authors, Lily Morris, she is a business ethics person. So she, yeah. they, team, they had a great team, right? So they had Jerry Kane, but they had uh, Mike, Tedrescu, who was a computer scientist specializing on AI, and they had Lily Morris and 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 Fayed Awad, I think. So anyway, so they really got the experts together to talk about fairness of AI, both the computational side and and the, the real the societal sides. Um, next to the ethics thing, uh, another thing you know that pops pops to the front here right now is legal issues. So, which yeah. is obviously a culmination of I guess of of ethical and other issues, but you know, and that made me think as well, like wow, I haven't seen a lot of research on the IT and legal aspect either. Not even, you know, yeah. even outside of IS, I ha just haven't seen a lot of that. I have a, an old friend who's sort of like a lawyer who is getting to this and from the practice side of things, but really isn't that would be so fascinating. You know, how do we make lawsuits in folding AI? Yeah, yeah the first one we saw, and it's on, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess culpability and, and that sort of thing. Uh, is Kirsten Martin, one of my colleagues here in Journal of Business Ethics, and we cite her paper. So we should put that on the on the notes uh, because that's the one that I've seen that did a good job. There's, of course, my paper that I've told you about multiple times with Carolina on bots, but that's got like a paragraph at the end about culpability. And we cite something there as well. That, that uh, But yeah, that's the whole thing. Who's responsible? Who's culpable? Uh, how? for what the AI is doing. Right? Yeah, I mean, in wrapping this up, I mean, you, you start off by saying like, we didn't want to give a laundry list of research questions. And in all fairness, in one of the draft versions, we had a laundry list, like a table with 17 research questions in four different areas, right? Around managing AI, which is fine. And then we said, now let's scrap this and rather talk about three or four selected frontiers in more depth and with more substantiveness. And I think as we discussed now, if people really read the paper, I think that should trigger a lot more thinking and ideation than, oh, I'm going to pick question number 15 from that list of 17, right? So, you know, as we just know, what about quantum computing? What about the next thing in ethics and legal? You know, these are really interesting issues. I don't even know what the question is, but it does make me think about it. And I hope, yeah. you know, I hope the readers get the uh, get the same feeling as when they read it. And then, you know, my angle for how to come up with a research question is to read the research, right? <laughs> don't pull a question out of your air and and air. Uh, uh out of your air <laughs> don't pull <laughs> don't pull the question out of your air and uh and 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 just go research it right go read what other people have said and and get to the current most understand exactly the cutting edge of that area and then come up with your own it's going to be better than anything i give you Right. If you if you understood that, like if it's legal issues around uh, this stuff, right, you're if you do a lit review, you're going to be way better off than some silly question that we throw in a, at the back end of a. Find the conversation, listen first, then open up your mouth and, and talk. That's it. Maybe, maybe baby. I, should, I should listen to you a little bit more. Like I, I, I think I'm known for sometimes, you know, saying things a little bit too early, too loud. <laughs> do you really? I think I'm known for that, too. Hey, yo, you are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us listen to each other and we just talk. Is that what we we're... just talk? All right. Well, I'm very excited. Like over the next, uh, uh, you know, two weeks or so, we have seven episodes, uh, shorter ones, and we'll, they come out every every other day. Really, every second day, we're going to put them up. And afterwards, uh, you know, we'll go back to uh, to other topics. Um, there were a few that were suggested to us, a few that we have in our minds. We'll get some guests going and sort of, you know, do the second half of the the year for our second season, and we'll see where we are. It was good talking to you, Nick. All right, amigo. Always a pleasure. Talk soon. Bye-bye.